Hello my dear friends, my name is Ari Thurger and today I'm going to talk about Viking religious symbols. Images have always been present to denote ideas, feelings and ideologies and of course greatly linked to religious and spiritual beliefs. But on this subject I want to focus on Scandinavian history and during the Viking Age period of Scandinavia because it was a time when religious symbolism completely dominated the daily lives of the Scandinavian communities. Symbols were everywhere, in every physical and social space occupied by the Norse, because symbols provided a psychological context to both memory and oral tradition. Symbols are just like mythology, as I've said before, Mythology is a cultural code. The people to whom a certain mythological account belongs to will automatically understand it because the, their traditions, language, history, way of life and way of thinking is all printed in that mythological account. So, symbols are also people's memories. Collective memories turned into a symbol that everyone will understand the depth of that symbol without speaking any words. It is visual knowledge associated with the memory of a culture. Symbols are the simplified, stylized representation of knowledge. Now let's speak about some of the religious symbols greatly used by the Norse with more relevance in the Scandinavian society. To understand Viking symbols, we must try to find the origins of such symbols, the original meanings. Since the Paleolithic old way to the Bronze Age, solar symbols or motifs are the most common religious designs amongst the Germanic and Norse societies. We have a good example here, uh, Scandinavian Bronze Age engravings from Oslan in Sweden. Warriors with shields with solar motifs, an obvious martial character and a sense of virility and fertility of the masculine elements. Since the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, solar motifs are the most common and diversified religious symbols in the Germanic world, also occupying a large number of motifs in Scandinavia. Objectively, they were related to the god of the sky whose myths associated with chariots or sun chariots. The most famous religious object of this solar cult is the car pulled by a horse with golden discs, found in Trondheim, Denmark. The symbols can vary in the form of a wheel, a cross, a spinning circle, swastika, triskelion, etc. In the Viking Age, the solar symbolisms were transmuted into the worship of the gods Tyr, Huden and Thor. Another solar symbol is one quite familiar, a circle with a cross in its center. The symbol might actually have been the source of inspiration for the Christian cross. As you know, there are great chances that Christ was crucified on a Greek T-shaped cross, or most likely an X-shaped Roman cross. The adaptation of the solar symbol into the Christian cross was a method to facilitate the process of the conversion of the pagans. But this ancient solar symbol may very well be the representation of a rare and unique optical phenomenon produced by sunlight, which is called a halo. Sometimes it takes the form of a sun cross. This doesn't happen that often, so our ancestors to our ancestors, it might have had a deep divine meaning and they made sure to engrave that on stones. In many cultures, the spiral was linked to the journey of the soul after death into the unknown paths leading to the dwellings of the gods. For pre-Celtic and also Celtic peoples of Ireland, the spiral represented the manifestation of the divine energy, which was commonly engraved on funerary megalithic monument, sorry, such as the megalithic monument of New Grange. The spiral could represent the entry point for the world of the dead, 
hence the representation of spirals on the entrances of such monuments. In the Scandinavian case, we find many spiral motifs in wonderful representations of pre-Viking funerary stele on the island of Gotland, Sweden. The Sanders stone, for instance, the side arms of the main spiral are flanked by triangles, creating a flaming effect typical of solar emanations. The connection of this stele with a warrior cult is perceptible by the presence of other figurative elements such as warriors carrying spears, serpents and horses, the honeymistic representation of solar rays, possibly from forgotten myths. In the Viking period, the spiral is linked to the rituals of the god Hudan, as we can see in the stele of Stonchega, where a warrior carries a shield with spiral motifs alongside a Valkyrie, a Triskelion and a Vognut. The impression of the movement of the, of the Gotland spirals reminds us of spinning wheels, but this spinning movement may also be the representation of the ecstasy state that was essential in the Odinic cults. With this being said, the solar spiral was not merely a motif to beautify funerary stele, but were, was also related to a system of faith that maintained some traces of ancient shamanic practices and altered states of consciousness, converging to perceptions of cosmology and being a metaphor of the transition between the world of the living and of the dead. This can also be seen in Anglo-Saxon England, where the various forms of solar symbolism, spirals, discs, etc. were engraved in coins. One of the most ancient and widespread symbols of the Eurasian world is the so-called Filhot, although the name is quite modern and there is no record of the original term in the literary sources. It's also known as a swastika. We have a couple of examples such as a 5th century Germanic bronze brooch with the Filhot re represented by serpents a 8th century Scandinavian Viking Age axe pendant with a Filfold motif, the Sondlev stone from Denmark with a swastika and interlaced horns, the Trifold, and of course from one of the most interesting Scandinavian archaeological findings, a 8th century Filfold detail from the Royal Osberg Tapestry from Norway. In the Scandinavian region, the swastika is clearly perceived as a derivation of the spiral. If the symbol was represented beforehand with numerous horns, from the period of migration onward, the spiral is popularized with four curved arms, but in the same way being a stylized representation of the sun. It's interesting to see the representation of both the swastika and the threefold in the Snondlev stone. The horns symbolize the moon, while the swastika symbolizes the sun. In the ancient Germanic cults, some horses were adorned with horns. This may have been part of a moon cult. Swastikas were also used in funerary pots and urns in the northern and continental Germanic area. They can represent the passage of the seasons during the year, which might indicate the transition of human life itself. The Anglo-Saxon pagan kings also had sword sheets with the representation of the swastika. Or in the Germanic spears, for instance, at the same time a symbol of victory and giving martial protection to their owners. For the Viking era, it's quite possible that the swastika was linked to the hammer of the god Thor. Remembering that his weapon was spun a circulatory movement before being thrown, or to represent thunder and fire from the sky, which can be seen in some objects of personal use, such as axe-shaped axe pendants with swastikas. The axe predates the hammer in Scandinavia. There are other evidences of this association between Thor, 
thunder with the swastika. We have evidences of this symbol in Lapland, in the cult of Urugales, also known as Toragales, the Sami Finnish version of the thunder god. There were shamanic drums painted with swastikas. There are also representations of swastikas of the Viking period associated with Huden, Odin, in earlier times, but no doubt Odin's greatest associations with the Filfot or the swastika were engraved on Christian monuments that retained part of the ancestral symbolism. The question of the survival of symbolic and religious elements of paganism in, in a Christ, Christian context is controversial, but without a doubt the cult of the god Huden was directly related to the representation of the Filfot in the Germanic Scandinavian world. That's the major reason for its survival by the Christianized communities. Now let's talk about the Filfot or the Viscalian. The symbols associated with the number 3 are some of the most common in the Nordic pagan religious representations and include a variety of morphological shapes. Initially, the Trifot, also called Triskelion, is another direct derivation of the spiral, quite similar to the swastika. It is a figure that has three legs, starting from the center, from the same point. Its significance from the Bronze Age to the early Middle Ages is very similar to other solar symbols, connected to the seasons of life and the deities of heaven. So we are basically talking about the same symbols, the same solar and seasonal representations, but with different artistic and cultural variations, as well as variations from specific historical periods. These Norse Germanic symbols are Indo-European symbols, very widespread Indo-European symbols, which in different geographical regions gained new connotations and new expressions. Some believe that the Trifot in the Nordic area is a variation of the Volknut, but I think they are two different symbols. Obviously, among all these symbols, there is a connection, since they are all related to the god Huden and the sacredness of the number three, solar cults, the seasons, etc. There is a very interesting pre-Viking stele of smiths in Gotland, in the Gotland Highland. Uh, the three fort representation in there is related to the heads of uh, three different animals, a wolf, an eagle and a boar, just above the figure of a woman carrying two snakes in each hand. In these two images occurred a fusion of the representation of two animals, a bird and a serpent. The serpent might mean that either Huden himself became a serpent, as we have in the myth of the mead of poetry. Huden becomes a snake to steal the mead, or it is a, a representation of the underworld represented by the dragon Nidhogr. In the folklore context of the Middle Ages, the serpent was connected to the protection of the female fertility, explaining why many Viking Arab women's tombs had coiled snake charms. They were a symbol of rebirth and life itself. In this case, the Smith Steely can be interpreted as a great magical provider from, from some female figure, maybe a underworld goddess. A rare variation of the Trifot is the one that uses three drinking horns observable in the runestone of Snondlet once again. Its meaning seems to be connected with the reception of the dead warrior in Valhalla, where a Valkyrie awaits him with a mead horn. In the prose Edda, the blood of Kvalsir, who was killed by the dwarfs Fjallar and Gaular, was collected in three containers named Son, Bodn and Odrorir. This blood was mixed with honey and formed the magical mead that transforms anyone into a poet and a sage. Thus, it might represent a state of wisdom, power, perhaps even joy only achieved after death or in the presence of Huda.
Then we have Rungnir's Hjerta, Rungnir's Heart, also commonly known as Vognut, which is a modern designation. I won't delve too much on this symbol because one year ago I have made a video about the Vognut. If you go into this upper corner, just click on the icon and you can watch that video. Suffice to say, this is one of the most used symbols by modern followers of Norse traditional paganism. Of all the solar symbols, the Volknut is the only one that has a reference in the literary sources. According to the Skaldskaparmal, after the god Thur confronts the giant Rungni, it is described that the giant would have a hard stone heart with three points, just like the engraved inscriptions of the name Rungnisierta, Heart of Rungnir. In spite of appearing in the myths related to the god of thunder, the appearance of this symbol in the stone monuments is totally connected to Hudan and his dominion. Basically, it is a sign of power and magic, which plays an important role in death rituals. The first form of the heart of Rungnir in the Scandinavian Germanic world is the Thriketa, of equal aspect to the Celtic correspondent, which is older. A figure formed by three terminals that interlaced in an undefined center. In the Scandinavian religious monuments in England, like the Brampton Ogbeck, the Triketa is inserted into a set flanked by triangles, again the idea of the number three, and surrounded by the paws of bears with their mouths tied, suggesting a control of one of the most important animals related to the Odinic rite. This entire representation celebrates and glorifies the warrior cult marked by Odin's intervention and possibly by the berserkers. In the funeral stele of Sanda II, <laughs> the Triketa appears literally by the side of the throne of the one-eyed god, with a similar sense. But the most important form of Rungnir's heart in the Scandinavian context is that of three united triangles, a symbol exclusive of the Viking Age, designated in modern times as Valknud, not of the dead. This religious image could possibly be linked or have a connection between the deities, the cosmos and the human destiny, similar to the Refjotur, war paralysis, a type of magic where a warrior by Odin's influence could not move during a battle. Thus, Valknut would symbolize the inevitable fate that exists between the supreme god and each individual, a symbol of the power Odin has to bind and untie. But this wouldn't be the only possible meaning for this symbol. Even in the daily lives of the Old Norse peoples, this symbol had its representation with the use of knots in women's hair and in art, in ornaments, sculptures, in multiple adornments, old, old would have the same principle, destiny, death and the norms. Now moving on to another symbol, which I must confess I often forget about it and people nowadays don't give it much use, the shield knot. It's an interesting symbol of pagan times, which recently started to be used by the public authorities in Scandinavia to mark sites of the Scandinavian historical heritage of the ancient Norse. It might have been a representation of the infinite or of eternity, because it is a drawing that as neither a beginning nor an end, intertwining in itself. And on that same line of thought could be a visual variation of the world serpent, Jormungandr. If we take a close look at the stele of uh, Hemlingbo in Gotland, we will notice that its sides and lower base have the representation of serpents. In this case, the symbolism could refer to an idea of stability and conservation of the natural order of the universe, just as what the world serpent itself represents. 
the purpose of Jormungandr isn't to destroy the world, a great enemy of the gods and a bringer of chaos. The world serpent is a protective symbol, the guardian of the mortal world. The Mjolnir, Thor's hammer. Everyone knows this symbol. Every neo-pagan who follows the Norse traditions at some point had, or still has, one of these. Uh, of all the religious symbols of Scandinavia, of the Viking Age, Thor's hammer certainly has the most literary references in both the Eddas and the Icelandic sagas, as well as numerous representations of the object on pendants found in archaeological excavations. In these sources, we can characterize Thor's hammer in three main categories. As a ritual and magical instrument, the hammer consecrates births, marriages, deaths, funerals, oaths, secures properties, consecrates uh, the land and property, propitiates the resurrection and fertility of life, a phallic symbol and a border mark, and also used to locate thieves. As a weapon, it defends the world, the gods and man against the forces of chaos. And as a tool and an instrument, the hammer protects against uh, natural elements. The hammer must have been a variation of the axe, a symbol of lightning, lightning in Scandinavia. Several rock engravings of the Neolithic and the Bronze Age show warriors bearing ceremonial axes. There are no records of hammers being used in battles during the Viking Age, which leads us to believe that axes and hatchets uh, continue to be connected to the cult of Thur. We have good examples of this, for instance, the 10th century pendants with axes alongside small hammers found in Merka, Sweden, or the Gudri statuette of the 11th century found in Iceland, a representation of Thor holding an axe. The axe handle merges with the beard of the figure, not only demonstrating that the beard and hammer were symbols of masculinity, but that the cult of Thor may also have had connections with bearded priests. Other representations connect Thor to shamanism, blacksmiths and warrior cults, as in the Orogaldis cult in the Lapland area. As previously shown, the drums showed a male figure with a hammer or a swastika. Mjolnir seems to have been a ritualistic object, as well as, as a magical and a symbol of protection and fertility. Since Thor has loads of similarities with Orogales, the Sami deity, it's quite possible that his hammer is the representation of the shaman's hammer with which the shamans beat their drums. Thor was a Germanic deity, a Saxon deity, before being brought to Scandinavia, but it's quite possible that the continental Thor was mingled with the true Scandinavian thunder god and the Sami deity. Thor's weapon can be a club, an axe and a hammer. The human sacrifices to Thor were killed with a club, beaten to death. This demonstrates that this god was worshipped since prehistoric times. First, his weapon was a club, a hard piece of wood, quite primitive, which continued to be used until the early Middle Ages as a sacrificial weapon to the god Thor. Then we have the axe. Thor's hammer was actually an axe, not used for human sacrifices, but as a ritualistic object in all sorts of ceremonies. And finally, we have the hammer. The use of the hammer in battle came during the feudal period of Scandinavia, a long time after the end of the Viking Age. The great majority of the Scandinavian population was no longer pagan. But I do believe Thor's weapon as a hammer came way before the hammer was introduced as a weapon. Thor's hammer might be the Bronze Age and Iron Age representation of the blacksmith's tools with which they work on metals. 
first metals were worked in their raw state. Just beat them and beat them until it gained the shape people wanted. Then it started to be worked while hot, beating the hot metal, unleashing flames and sparkles. Quite a spectacle, almost as if the god himself was unleashing his thunders through his weapon. So the club was for sacrifices, the axe for ceremonies, and the hammer for the magic of the blacksmiths. I'm sure one of the subscribers of this channel, Mr. Halloween, a good friend, knows exactly what I am talking about. He, better than me, knows about the true magic of blacksmithing. There are other symbols which I won't talk about on this video because I am reserving that for other videos where I can delve much more on such subjects, such as animal totems of ancient Scandinavia. I'll make a video solely about that. So I shall finalize this video, finally, with runic symbols. Runic symbols, not the runes. By the end of the Middle Ages, a variety of runic symbols appear, adapted or related to the runes and directly linked to magical work. Although the Scandinavians uh, during the Viking Age used simple and combined runes for religious and magical rituals, there is no evidence that Icelandic magical symbols were known and used before the 11th century. Incidentally, there are no traces of runes in Iceland throughout the Middle Ages, only in other regions of Scandinavia and even in Greenland. The Renaissance period popularized the use of these symbols in magical books called grimoires, which combined knowledge derived from astro astrology, uh, the Kabbalah, alchemy and eastern and western magical rituals. The most famous Nordic grimoire is the Galdra book, dating from the 17th century and containing 47 magical incantations, which fused the traditions from the Vikings with the continental European magic that solidified after the 15th century. Of all the symbols present in this work and other Scandinavian grimoires, the only one that can have a Viking origin is the so-called Algisjalmur and other variations of the same, which is quoted in the poem Fofni Small. In this poem, the symbol would bring victory to its possessor, and in the same poem, this symbol belongs to the treasure of Sigurd, from which it is deduced that it would be engraved in a helmet. At the same time, this description of a magical object in Fafnir's head is related to an European tradition that dates back to the Greeks and survived until the end of the Middle Ages. From a stone the dragons possessed on their heads, snake stone or draconite, used for healing purposes. In some Icelandic sagas, the symbol is also described as giving protection in battles. Halgisjalmur is translated as the helm of Hall or of Heigir due to its shape in the grimoires, a circle formed of eight arms in the form of tridents, resembling the ship ruder of boats. The problem is that this type of nautical instrument was only known in Scandinavia by the 13th century. The Vikings used a transverse oar as a ruder. Because Hegir was a sea-related deity, perhaps Nordic modern scholars have fused to this folklore uh, the trident of Neptune, explaining its morphology, or even the trident of the devil from the Christian mythology. Anyway, there are no images of this symbol before the 15th century, and we do not know its original form among the Vikings, even if it was already known by that time. This symbol is an ancient symbol, but the representation we have today is quite recent. Runic symbols, unlike the runes, are medieval and modern symbols, so they are quite new in Scandinavian history and have loads of influences from other cultures. But the runes themselves, 
those are prehistoric, quite ancient. The most ancient rune symbols engraved on stones that I know of date back to 6,000 years ago, late Stone Age, and they are not from Scandinavia. They are actually from northern Portugal, from Alvão. A bit of a mind blow. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video, quite a long one, <laughs> maybe a little bit boring, but well, it's done. Well, see you on the next video. Thank you so much for watching and luck for you.